the same brain, the same heart. The same body, but different. Very different. The same places, the same experiences, the same people, but very different. The same world, the same songs, the same everything, but different. What would it be like to be stuck to someone for your whole life? Welcome to Extraordinary Stories Podcast. Hey, how are you? Are you well? Are you good? I am. Welcome to the short stories episode for this week. As always, a thank you for your feedback on uh, previous episodes. Lots of uh, great feedback on the Miranda Barber episode. I know people felt quite strongly about Miranda. And yes, good. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that. (laughs) Because I did too. Okay, we're going to go straight to the shout-outs. Now, the shout-outs in this episode, there's just one. There's just one big shout-out. And ah, I'm just going to tell you this. Because it's kind of lovely and it's kind of sad all at the same time, but I just love it. So I got an email from lovely woman called Sylv. Now, Sylv's real name is Sylvia, and she is in Germany. And Sylv reached out to me because she's going through a tough time in her life. So she emailed me to say, that she's having a time at the moment where sadly her and her husband divorced after 30 years of marriage. Now at the same time that her divorce happened, her two grown up children left the house. One went to university and one went abroad for work. So Sylve found herself in a place where she was in a house with her husband, her two kids, and then all of a sudden, she was on her own. So, as she said to me, she was recognising it was empty nest syndrome, but also just a little bit of heartbreak. This was about two months ago. Anyway, a month ago, Sylve, through another podcast, found Extraordinary Stories podcast, and she got in touch to say that She has become so obsessed with Extraordinary Stories podcast that now she just plays it in the house all the time, on a loop. She just likes to play the episodes over and over again. She plays them loudly so that they're playing through the house. And she said, and I just think it's the loveliest, sweetest thing, she just said, In a time of real loneliness, I just love to have your voice through my house because it just takes the edge slightly off of that loneliness. And I asked her, I I said to her, so is it all right if I 
because she wanted a shout out. And I was like, is it okay if I just, if I tell that, that that's how you feel? And she was like, yep, absolutely. I'm happy to say that's how I feel. So shout out to Sylv. And I'm delighted that I can be helping in any way whatsoever. So that's the shout out in this episode. The one and only. Before I move on to the main story, I need to do a recommendation because I've done this on social media, but I'll keep this quick. If you are not listening to The Teacher's Pet podcast, get yourself involved now. You will not regret it. If you liked Serial, if you liked Dirty John, if you just love a story that's going to make you want to tear your hair out, scream the place down, be shocked, be sad, then you need to be listening to The Teacher's Pet. It's the number one podcast in Australia at the moment and it details the story of a woman who went missing in 1982 in Australia and the circumstances around it. Now, that might not sound like, you might think, you might, you might think oh, there's a million podcasts about people who go missing in cold cases. Nothing is like this story, I can guarantee you. Anyone who's heard it, I know that at this moment you're going, yeah, Barry, I agree. It is so exceptionally good. So please, the teacher's pet, give it a go. It's brilliant. Okay, right, on with the short story. Are you ready? Okay. Let's go. All right, let's start with this question. What do I love? From all the stories that you've heard me tell, what do I love? I'm going to give you three seconds to think about it. Go. Um, all right, those with a filthy mind, you can just uh, keep it to yourself. What do I love? Well, the answer is twins. So, so far I've covered Jennifer and June, the silent twins. I've covered the yoga twins. And I was going to rest the twin stories for a while because I thought maybe I'm maybe I'm weirdly becoming the twin obsessed podcast, <laughs> which I didn't really want to become. But then this story landed in my lap and I was like, I have to tell this story. It's so good. So let's start this story with this. <laughs> Keep thinking of you, blessing the love we knew. Every morning when I awake, have my coffee and coffee cake. I pour coffee for two, just as I did. What you are hearing there is the dulcet tones of Daisy and Violet Hilton. And that singing was a recording of them performing in their vaudeville act under the name The Hilton Sisters. But how did they get to vaudeville? More importantly, what made them so special that they got to vaudeville. In Brighton, England, just just near London, in 1908, a maid, a poor, lowly, underpaid maid called Kate Skinner, found herself 
pregnant. Now, was Kate in a relationship? No. She'd had an affair with her boss's son. And the identity of the father was kept entirely a secret all through her pregnancy. And when the time came for Kate, who was entirely on her own, to give birth, she gave birth to twins. Now, as soon as the twins were born, and it was a difficult, difficult birth, it was discovered that the babies were born joined at their lower backs. Kate had given birth to conjoined twins. Now, I'm no conjoined expert. (laughs) I'm really not. But I do know that sometimes with conjoined twins, the difficulties and the problems around that and the reason that conjoined twins really sadly don't often exist beyond birth is that often they share organs or that you've got two bodies fighting for the same blood supply. You have all those things. But that wasn't the case because these two babies were born joined at the lower back but not sharing any organs. I was thinking to myself, it's one of those things that like nowadays you could probably do a procedure for that, but I don't think in 1908 they would have known really what the best procedure would have been. And and at that time, sadly, any twins that were born conjoined, they just didn't really even survive a couple of days. So not really sure how to feel about it. Kate was pretty sure that she didn't want these babies. She just didn't know what to do with them. She just had no clue at that moment what to do with conjoined twins. She was on her own. She was a maid. She didn't have any money. She didn't know what to do. So she gave the girls away. Well, actually, she sold them is what she did. And she sold them to a midwife called Mary Hilton. So now the twins, who were called Violet and Daisy, they went as babies to be raised by Mary. Mary, the midwife, raised the girls and helped them adjust to their very special circumstances. I'm not going to say Mary was an angel in the situation. Mary kind of exploited the fact that she was raising conjoined twins. At age three, the girls would be paraded around and shown off. And Mary would make a little bit of money out of this because she could put them into a show here or there. Or she could, you know, pay for people to come and see the the weird twins who were joined at the back. Although Mary did a really good thing by taking them, she still kind of exploited them. However, Mary was a good mother to the girls. You know, she raised them well, she taught them well, and she helped them. Sadly, Mary died when the girls were seven. But, If that was tragic, what's about to happen down the path of their life is even more tragic. If I had some, um, (laughs) if I had some baddie theme tune or a piece of music that would like indicate that a villain was coming into the situation, I would play it right now. Mary, she had an elder daughter who was essentially the twins' elder step-sister. And her name was Edith. And Edith get married. His name was... Wait for it. 
Meyer Myers. <laughs> what a f***ing ridiculous name. Meyer Myers. So basically the same first name as surname, but with an S shoved on it. It's ridiculous. So, I, like, I would be... I'd be Barry Barry's. <laughs> Which is just stupid. If you were called Derek, you'd be Derek Derek's. And it's, it was just so stupid. So, Meyer Myers and Edith, the girl's older sister, they took control of the girls. Now, Meyer Myers, I may add, his previous job before working in um, sideshows was that of a balloon salesman. I mean, <laughs> this guy just gets more ridiculous by the second. Fucking balloon salesman, whatever. So they take the two seven-year-old twins from England to America and they start parading them around freak shows in America. Oh, they're only like seven years old. It's awful. And the twins were, I mean, they're fully under the control of Mayor Mayors. And he would become really violent with the twins if they didn't fall into line with his ideas. If they didn't perform when he wanted them to, they knew about it. He would really hit them. The girls were essentially completely captive at this point. They had nowhere else that they could run. They had nowhere else that they could go. I mean, Mayor Mayors is not fucking endearing himself to me here at all. They were heralded as the Freak Sisters. The conjoined twins who had survived what killed so many before. So, the years pass... And Daisy and Violet, they are taken all around the world and held up as the Freak Show sisters. In that time, they are forced to go on stage and both play instruments, to sing, to dance, to perform circus acts like juggling, they're forced to learn all of these things by Mayor Mayors. He completely forces them to go on stage every night and do this. And people are willing to pay to come and see the two twin sisters who are stuck together by their backs do these things. So this gets them into the vaudeville scene. And there's now headlines about the sisters Everyone wants to see them. They are the hottest ticket in town. It's really odd when you'll see, like, I'll put up lots of photographs of them on social media. They're both, oh, they're both, like, really, oh, really lovely-looking girls, right? They're really, really nice-looking. Yes, they're completely identical. But seeing all the photography that you see of them, it just kind of looks like two people standing back-to-back. You don't really, you know, there's no abnormality necessarily about it. You're not looking at it and going, I'm seeing abnormality or deformity. What you're seeing is actually just looks like the two of them are standing back to back all the time. So it, it's it's almost odd. I kind of want you to, when you see the pictures, when you look at them, it won't be possible. But sort of forget that I've told you that they're joined at their lower backs by skin. Forget that. And you will just look at them and go, that just looks like, oh, there's two females standing back to back and each is playing an instrument. Or there's two females standing back to back and they're singing or whatever. It doesn't, you know, nothing nothing particularly jumps out at you that you would go, oh, wow, okay, I'm really looking at something. You know, like a lot of these freak shows were about looking at something that was abnormal. Yes, it's, of course, it's abnormal. I, I mean, I imagine if you watch them move together and watch them walk on and walk off the stage, that would be odd. But the still photographs of them don't really give you that. They just look like they're standing back to back. So are Daisy and Violet enjoying this time? Happy at this time? No, of course, 
they're not. They're being bullied, they're being threatened by Meyer Myers to perform because he's making big, big money out of the twins. He's taking them everywhere and anywhere and he's putting them on any stage that he can to make money out of people who want to see the conjoined twin sisters. Now, at this point, they're beginning to grow towards teenagers. So they're becoming sort of 14, 15. And I have some questions. Okay, I'm going to throw out a few things that are going around my head with this story. I've got questions just about what it is to be joined to someone entirely. Joined, you know, you and someone else are joined at your lower spine. And don't think me basic, don't think me obvious or silly when I ask these questions, but how does either Daisy or or Violet, how do they deal with the absolute lack of alone time? in their life. I mean, it's essential. Is it not essential as a human being that we have time away from everybody else? Even if that's 10 minutes just away on your own. But for them, there is no option. It just doesn't exist. And kind of along those lines, and again, (laughs) don't think me, Don't think me silly when I ask this. How do they cope with things like puberty and going through that time when you're learning to explore your own body, masturbation? Like, how does that happen? Privacy is not an option for them. Now, I suppose you can say, well, privacy has never been an option. So they've learned from a very, very, very young age that they're always together and everything they do has to always be together. But as you grow up and your emotions change and your hormones change and your feelings about the world change, those things have got to be very, very, very challenging when you're connected entirely 24 hours a day to someone else. What happens if, like, I was thinking, (laughs) what happens if they have an argument? What happens if they fall out about something? Well, there's fuck all that they can do. You can't go anywhere. It's not like you and me, like we have an argument with someone, you might leave the room. I don't tend to leave the room if I've had an argument with someone, I just tend to go quiet um, and, and stay there. But if you had, to, you know, like lots of people will have an argument and they like to storm out. Well, there's no chance for Daisy or Violet. <laughs> They're not <laughs> storming out of anywhere. They're stuck there. I just think it's, I just, yeah. There's so many of those human things that I'm like, it's, we take these things because we are ourselves individual and we're independent and we can do that for granted. Must just be impossible when you're, when you're stuck to someone all the time. And that leads me on to also thinking about How do these two and other conjoined twins deal with relationships? And that we're going to get to later because it's fucking bonkers what happens with these two. So let's go back to where Daisy and Violet were. They're big in vaudeville. Okay, they're really big. Everyone knows who they are. And what's happening now is they're starting to meet stars, celebrities, they're beginning to appear in the biggest vaudeville shows. And this is all driven by Mayor Mayors, the balloon salesman. (laughs) But for years, he had abused the twins. He had never given them a single penny for what they did. Nothing. They were treated like animals by him. He just made them get up 
do their act and he took all the money and the money was big. He was earning big bucks out of them. So it gets to 1931. They're 22 years old. This started when they were seven with him. That is years of them performing, parading, being photographed, being taken around the world and he's making all the money. But they decide, and fucking good on them, they decide, we need to do something here because this can't continue. And so what they do is, they've got no money, they don't have a penny between them. And they decide, right, what we're going to do is, we're going to go to some of the celebrities that they had kind of met on the vaudeville circuit and they come to some of the celebrities and they say, look, here's the situation. We're being taken for everything here. We have absolutely no money. Can you afford us some money to get a lawyer? Because we need to get away from our manager. And these celebrities, they help. God bless them. Thank God that they did. So, Daisy and Violet, they managed to raise enough money to get a lawyer and take a lawsuit out against Meyer Myers. And in that lawsuit, they win. Because Meyer Myers doesn't really have a a leg to stand on here. He has exploited these girls for years and they walk away with $100,000 in compensation for the exploitation that they've been put up with and the abuse that he's put them through for years. They said of the time just before the lawsuit, we were living like paupers. We had nothing. We were lonely, rich girls. Rich, but without any money, living in poverty. So now, free of their manager, the girls, they went out on their own. Now, they decided not to make a career change at this point. They decided they wanted to stay in the world of performing. So they made a few changes. Daisy, at this point, she they were both dark-haired, the twins. Daisy dyes her hair blonde. They start to dress differently to differentiate themselves. Sadly, the vaudeville scene at that point was kind of dying out. So what the twins do is they get themselves into the world of burlesque. Da na na na. Um, <laughs> the girls they actually did really well in the world of burlesque. I mean, it's sort of an odd image when you think about it. <laughs> These conjoined twins doing burlesque. But, you know, it, it it worked for them. They earned enough money between the lawsuit and between their burlesque act to rent an apartment in New York. Now, I said earlier that I would address the romantic side of their life. And it was around about the time when they had broken away from their manager and they had their own place that they both begun to date. How was my question. How the fuck are they doing this? <laughs> well, like this. They would go out. They'd go to bars. They would, you know, meet men. And they would, you know, bring a man home. Now, in their New York apartment, just picture this. I want you just to get a visual picture of this. In their New York apartment, they installed a phone box. So a proper sized phone box. And this is what would happen. Let's just say it was Daisy, right? Let's just say it was Daisy. She had met a man. So... The girls would come back to the apartment. Daisy's gentleman caller. (laughs) He would come along. And what would happen was Daisy and the gentleman caller (laughs) 
would go into the phone box and they would have their romantic time in that phone box while Violet stood outside. Well, obviously she can't be that far away from Daisy. So the way that it would happen is like the door would kind of close. So Daisy's back would obviously be towards the door. So it, you know, there was there was a bit of a gap but essentially, it it gave just the littlest bit of privacy to Daisy and her gentleman caller. And the same would happen if Violet brought someone back. They would go into the phone box and the other twin would stand just outside of it. Are you seeing that in your brain? It is a weird, weird picture to try and imagine. It does take a bit of thinking to get there. But I can I can kind of see what they're thinking with that. But because I don't see how there would be any other kind of privacy. You're not going to be able to lie down in a bed. You're not going to be able to have sex in your living room. You're not going to be able to have sex in your garden or your shed. Right? You're just not. <laughs> not that they would be having sex in the garden or the shed. Well, I don't know. Maybe they would. Um, so the phone box idea... It's weird to picture, but I can kind of, in some bizarre way, get to what they were thinking with that. (laughs) Why would they be in a shed? Sometimes (laughs) the twin who was not engaged with the gentleman caller would just be reading a book. Or, (laughs) as Daisy said years later, sometimes just knitting (laughs) or filing her nails. (laughs) <laughs> I just just think it's so weird like and it, it's human nature and it has to happen and people have to have sex but can you imagine the person who's joined to you at your lower back they're like shagging somebody and you're just doing your knitting <laughs> I just find it so odd oh does it creep you out does it I'm not going to lie, it kind of creeps me out slightly. Not conjoined twins, that doesn't creep me out. The sex part of it slightly creeps me out. I just don't know how it can ever be romantic or sexy or any of those things. But here's the thing. The girls were struggling with it. They were struggling with the fact that they wanted these relationships and it was causing them difficulty. So, yes, as much as Daisy might say, well, I was just doing my knitting while Violet was shagging this guy, actually, they were having difficulty. And they reached out to the one and the only Harry Houdini. Now, side note, I'm going to do a Harry Houdini episode in the future because he is fucking fascinating. His life is fascinating. What that man achieved in terms of magic and in terms of tricks and in terms of just death-defying things is incredible. Anyway, that aside, Harry Houdini had met the twins on the vaudeville circle and he was fascinated. So, he steps in to their life and he teaches them how to achieve what he calls mental liberty. And mental liberty, although it sounds great, (laughs) was essentially the process of being able to completely separate yourself mentally from what was going on with the twin that was attached to you. So it meant that if one of them was in a romantic or a sexual encounter with someone else, the other twin had learned from Harry Houdini the ability to just mentally, completely disassociate from that moment. Hmm, yeah, I know. Odd. I mean, this just makes me think of, like, have you ever been in the room, right? (laughs) Well, (laughs) be honest with yourself. Have you ever been in a room where you've either been having sex with someone... (laughs) And there's other people in the room and you're trying to be quiet. Or you've been the person in the room while other people are having sex and you're like, oh, for fuck's sake. And it just gets really awkward because then you have to hear people's sex noises and you're like, eh, it's horrible. But anyway, that's what Harry Houdini was trying to push 
the girls through. He was trying his hardest to get them through that situation. So he, he taught them well. They were able to zone right out. So in 1934, the twins were 23 by this point. And Violet gets engaged to a man who she has been seeing for a while. They get engaged. They're really excited about getting married. Obviously, there's lots of questions there because if you're marrying Violet, you're essentially marrying Violet and Daisy. And that was really the big fundamental problem. There were 22 states in America that refused to issue them a marriage license because they kept saying, we cannot have one man marrying two women. Unfortunately, Violet's fiancé gets to the point where he's sick of it. He realises that actually he's never going to be able to marry her. And he leaves. He's had enough. Now, it's really important at this point that the twins are having relationships. And the reason is this. Their, their popularity was beginning to fade a little bit. Everyone, I think, felt a little bit like, well, we've seen this now. We've seen the two girls who are joined at the lower backs. We've seen them perform songs. We've seen them do instruments. We've seen them dance. And so actually, really, marriage and being in that, you know, like marriage as a kind of, how the fuck will that work? was the only way that they could really keep their name in the press. It was really the only way that they could do something that would gain a bit more interest in them. And I just feel... I feel really sad for them at that point. That that's the only way that they were... You know, could keep any kind of notoriety or keep any kind of celebrity was to was to get married and let the newspapers print, you know, one man marries these sisters who are stuck together. You still get it nowadays, obviously. You still get, like, it's like fucking... What's her name? Fucking Kim Kardashian. Do you know what I mean? Like, marrying, literally, for the celebrity that comes with it. Not for... Not really because, you know, you're marrying who you love, but you're marrying to keep your name in the papers. Keep your name fucking... On, so you're trending number one on Twitter. And fuck off. I just think they deserve better. These girls, I think they deserved a lot better. But I also think if if you look at like where we've, where, what we've talked about so far, if you go from the fact that when there were three, Mary the midwife, their mother, was exploiting them, to the age seven when the balloon salesman took them on, all they've ever known really is to be famous. All they've ever known is to be celebrity. So this is what's kind of driving them. So, in order to keep this going, Violet agrees that she is going to marry a gay actor. And just to add to the freak element, they get married in a football stadium. 7,000 people turn up to watch this freak wedding. To watch these sisters walk down the aisle while Violet marries this man. Now, obviously, he's not out gay. It was just that kind of time in Hollywood life and, you know, when people got married to cover things up. Um, what, who am I thinking of? Um, like, Doris Day and Rock Johnson, that whole thing. Like, he was gay. She was gay, but it, you know, it was good, it was good celebrity publicity for the both of them to get married. So they're married, right? They get married and about three months into it, Violet does not a very clever thing here. In a press interview, she openly says that he's gay. She doesn't really mean it. She lets it slip. Now the outcry is massive. Supporters of the Hilton sisters were fucking furious they were raging they were like we've been lied to you basically created this marriage for publicity and we're angry so 
a divorce happens and the careers now of Daisy and Violet are really, really diminishing. They're no longer in demand. And sadly, they retreat into quite an isolated life. Money begins to run out quite fast for them. They end up taking on a job in a supermarket. Again, I'm, I'm just going to say this. I just don't really know how that works. Like, I don't really know how it works with them in a supermarket. I mean, I can't imagine just going in and being like, I'm just going to get some bread, some egg, <laughs> some milk, and you walk up and then you see these two sisters and you're like, okay, <laughs> sorry, what's going on when you get to the till? And I'm not being funny when I say that because what I mean is, actually... If you saw them on the vaudeville stage, if you saw them within the freak show, if you saw them within the burlesque show, you know what you're looking at. That's very different from walking into a supermarket and they're stacking a shelf. Does that make sense? Do you see what I'm saying? It's it's a very different thing. So things aren't great for them. They're back to living a really, really poor, poor life. In 1968, aged 60 and almost broke Daisy contracts a severe flu now because the twins aren't connected by any organs just by skin Violet is completely unaffected by this but after a week of that flu Daisy sadly dies Can you imagine being Violet at that point? Can you imagine you had spent your whole entire life, every day of your existence with your sister stuck to you and now that sister is dead and you're alive? Three days after Daisy's death, Violet also dies and there's no diagnosis on what killed Violet. My guess, a broken heart. So in 1968, the world said goodbye to Daisy and to Violet Hilton. What was their last wish? The last wish was to be buried in a coffin wide enough to fit the both of their bodies. And they got what they wanted. Daisy and Violet Hilton were buried together so that they would always be together. And so ends the story. Every hour of every day Every minute that you're away I keep thinking of you Blessing the love we knew Every morning when I... All right then. That was Daisy and Violet. Let me know what you think. Give me your thoughts. I really want to hear them. A strange one. A strange one in that when I was <laughs> going through this and I was going, right, how am I going to tell this story and what am I going to do with this bit and this bit, I just, I just kept arriving at more questions all the time. And arriving at so many questions that I was like, how does, you know, how does even the most basic things happen when that's your life situation? How do the big things happen? And then what I realised is, actually, they got to the age of 60, living the life like that. And they made it work. They answered their own questions. They figured it out for themselves. So maybe it's not up to me 
to try and <laughs> work out all the small details because they clearly had that all worked out. In so many ways, I kind of respect Daisy and Violet because I think they were born into a shit fucking circumstance. But they survived it. And they, you know, they went on and yeah, they had a horrible few years under a terrible manager. But, you know, they took ownership of their own life and I know that in the end it didn't work out for them and, you know, they didn't have very much money. But I think there's a, I think there's, I think there's a lot of strength in their story as well. I think there's a real nice strength at the two of them you know you can go on youtube and you can find clips of them and i urge you to do it because it's really interesting just to watch two of them performing together there's something about it (laughs) this is going to sound strange there's something about it that's yes it's odd because you know you're watching two twins who are joined at the lower backs but also there's something about it that you just go they don't look utterly unhappy in their lives, they look like they're having an okay time. Do you know what I mean? They look like they look like they're fine. And I think what I didn't want to do with this story was I didn't want to make them seem powerless, and I didn't want to make them seem like victims the whole way through it because I don't think that they were. Yet they were given a shit start and a shit shit sorry a shit circumstance in life. But I think they also m- took a lot of ownership of of what their life was, and they did the best with what they could and I respect that and I really respect anybody who can go yeah I've been given a bit of a shitty hand here I'm stuck to someone else that's never going to change because medicine isn't at a point where it can disconnect us but you know what we're just going to keep living our lives and we're just going to keep keep moving forward and do the best that we can and yeah like I said maybe it wasn't the best in the end for them but I don't think that Violet and Daisy had an wholly miserable life. I don't think from day one until day of death was entirely miserable. They were good points for them throughout that. Anyway, that's my piece said on the story. So, I hope you enjoyed this wee short story. If you want to get in touch, please do. Facebook, join the Facebook group. Or oh, there's a Facebook page. You can just like the page if you want. Instagram, Twitter, email me, send me an email. Love getting emails. Extraordinary Stories Podcast at gmail.com. I love it when you email me. If you want to write me a letter, that would be nice. <laughs> no, don't write me a letter. Don't waste your time. <laughs> Do other things with your time. <laughs> don't write me letters. Um, although I would love it. You've got better things to do with your time. We all do. As always, thank you for listening and until the weekend. Okay, goodbye. It didn't, it didn't affect me really one way or the other. <laughs> <laughs> I would imagine from the look on his face, let's get it on, let's do it, let's get it over. Let's get it on, let's do it, let's get it over.